I am delighted to be here talking to you about climate change, which is a funny sentence to utter because you don't usually hear the words delight and climate change in the same sentence. But um, as Peter mentioned, you put this on the agenda, and that really is why I'm delighted. Um, I think it is a very important topic. It's obviously critical to the future of the work that you all do, um, and the fact that you're interested in engaging on it is delightful to me. So I want to start today talking about climate change by introducing you to my new friend. This is a tiny baby coffee plant. It's a little hard to see, so there's a, a picture of what it looks like a little bit bigger there on the screen. Um, and I showed this to my two-year-old daughter on a FaceTime call yesterday. Her new favorite word is special. So when she saw it, she goes, special coffee. And she's right, it is very special coffee. This plant was um, created, it was cloned in a lab in Florida in what's called a phytosanitary lab. Phyto plant, sanitary, health, cleanliness. So this lab um, basically uh, it clones plants of all different kinds, um, but it does so in an environment completely free from basically any sort of threat to the plant. So there's no diseases, there's no pests, there's no microbes, there's no fungi. Um, it's in Florida, so it's probably climate controlled, air conditioned. Um, so basically this is a very privileged plant, right? It, it has all the, it has a leg up on pretty much every other coffee plant in the world. It came into, the, into being in a very um, coddled sort of way. But despite the fact that this is a very lucky plant, it is almost certainly gonna die before it produces its first coffee cherry. And that's because I'm gonna take it home with me to Portland, Oregon, where I live, where the mean annual temperature is 12 degrees Celsius, and I'm gonna put it in a pot in my garden, and winter's gonna come, and it's gonna die. Because what this plant wants is something closer to 20 degrees Celsius mean temperature. What it really wants is daytime highs of about 22, daytime lows of about 18. It's a fairly small range there. And thinking about the fragility of this plant in relation to the climate and the environment around us reminds us something about something that we, I think, sometimes forget or take for granted because it's so, it's so basic and intrinsic that we just look past it, which is it is a plant, right? So it pulls nutrients and water up through its roots. It eats sunlight. It converts these things into energy that helps it grow and produce the fruit that we turn into the coffee that we love and that our customers love. So it's a product of its environment, right? It depends on the wind and the rain and the sun around it. It doesn't grow inside a house or inside a climate controlled lab in Florida. Um, it grows out in the open. And it, and it is dependent on that environment um, to thrive. So to understand what the environment is that coffee can thrive best in, we have to go back to the origins of coffee. I'm talking here specifically about Arabica coffee, the coffee that we mostly in this room are focused on, one of the two main species that we consume and that is responsible for about 70% of the world market and almost 100% of the specialty market. So this, it's a little hard to see, but if you squint, you might be able to make out some coffee blossoms on these tall spindly plants. These are wild Arabica coffee trees in a, a native coffee forest in Southwest Ethiopia. And you can see that it's growing in a sort of dense shade. You can see that the plant is very tall. It's very lightly populated with, with branches and flowers. What you can't see, but what I can tell you is that it is growing in a sort of high elevation, mild, climate, so again, in that kind of 18 to 22 range, um, Celsius range. So it's, it's tropical, but it's cool, right? And this is the environment that Arabica evolved in. This is a coffee farm, a modern coffee plantation in Colombia. It looks very different, right? And you'll notice that the plant actually looks very different too. So it's, it's shorter, it's squatter, it's planted very densely together. There's obviously no shade around it. And really what the difference between these photos represents is the essence of human agriculture, right? We found uh, plants, sometimes animals, that we thought were useful, that we liked, that we were drawn to, and we began through um, in a sort of intensive ag agricultural relationship, we began to select the plants that had the traits that we liked and to leave aside the ones that didn't. And so what you're seeing here is a dwarf Arabica variety. It happens to have a single gene mutation that helps it grow smaller. Coffee farmers 
it, this just happened spontaneously. It's ac actually happened more than once in more than one place. So via Sarchi and Katura are both dwarf varieties, Arabica varieties, that have that same single gene mutation. Farmers noticed it and they thought, hey, that looks great. If a plant grows smaller, I can plant it more closely together. I can get more coffee off the same amount of land. It's probably going to be easier to harvest, et cetera. So we have selected for the traits that we want. Um, and this really is what we do in agriculture. Just to give you an extreme example, we have here the watermelon. On the right is a watermelon as you probably know it today. On the left, you have a watermelon as it was 5,000 years ago. This is the sort of ancient ancestor of the watermelon. It was much, much smaller, about five centimeters. It was very hard. You needed a hammer or a rock in order to open it up, and it was very bitter. Over 5,000 years, we have selected the watermelon to have the traits that we want it to have, right? We have um, evolved it to be much sweeter, so it's about three and a half times sweeter than it used to be, uh, much bigger, um, a lot easier to open, so you could probably drop the watermelon on the right from about a foot above the ground, and it would open up rather than having to use a hammer. We've also spread it around the world. So the ancient watermelon originated in Namibia, and the modern watermelon grows in places as far flung as Canada and Russia, right? So we've done the same thing with coffee. Although we have a much shorter history of selecting coffee, we still do have a history with it. So as I mentioned, Arabica evolved in Ethiopia. Most of us know that it's the birthplace of coffee. From Ethiopia, we'll say about 10,000 years ago is when we think Arabica evolved naturally in the forest. About somewhere between 500 and 1500, the historical record is not super accurate on this, um, but about 1,000 years ago, it moved from Ethiopia out of the forest and to Yemen, where it was domesticated on a more wide scale. It stayed in Yemen for a very long time, but eventually began to move out along Arabian trade routes, and then it really picked up speed uh, when the colonial era hit and uh, coffee became uh, considered a, a very viable cash crop. So from here, we have coffee going pretty much all over the world. We grow coffee commercially in about 70 countries now, non-commercially and more. And one of the reasons that coffee has been so successful at moving around the world in this way is because it has done an extraordinarily good job of convincing us that we need it, right? We just can't live without it. So in exchange for this alteration of our consciousness that it gives us, the alertness that it brings to us, we have helped it spread its genes around the world. This is even more remarkable because coffee is very genetically undiverse. It has very low genetic diversity. Arabica coffee in particular, World Coffee Research last year did a genetic analysis of a large collection of Arabica plants, and we discovered that it, basically it's one of the least genetically diverse large food crops in the world, large crops in the world. It'll be a little bit meaningless to you, but we determined that it's about has 1.2% diversity across single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, a plant like a crop like wheat or soy or rice has something more like 20 to 30%. So what that actually means is that the toolbox that Arabica has, the number of genes, the diversity of, of its genes is very small. Um, and that's a problem when you're trying to adapt to new environments and to new climates. We know that coffee doesn't only grow in one climate. Um, we did another study with SEAT last year where we actually defined what are the climate zones that coffee grows in. And of course, intuitively we know this. We see the picture of the forest in Ethiopia and the picture of the full sun plantation in um, Colombia. Maybe you've been to drier, hotter regions like Minas Gerais in Brazil. There is coffee growing in um, Zambia, which is also very hot and dry. So we, we know intuitively that that's not the same as a place like Turrialba, Costa Rica, which gets three meters of rain a year. So we know that it has some capacity, some variation um, in its ability to live in different environments, but they are not endless. Coffee is, like many tropical crops, can be thought of as a sort of Goldilocks crop, right? It doesn't want things to be too hot or too cold, too dry, too wet, it's a little more tolerant of. So coffee has the ability, it has a range that it, that it can sort of survive in, but it also has some, some hard limits. So what are some of those hard limits? As temperatures rise, um, and this could be coming down in altitude, you know, higher altitudes have lower temperatures, so as you move down the mountain, you get warmer temperatures. As temperatures rise, um, the first impact you begin to see is on quality. 
right? So the faster a plant uh, ripens, which tends to happen at higher temperatures, the less time it has to develop sugars and those volatile aromatics that we associate with the highest quality coffees. This is the reason why lower altitude coffees uh, don't tend to have as high a cup quality. It's also the reason why rising temperatures sh should be a significant concern of yours, not just from a sort of productivity standpoint, but also from a quality standpoint. So it affects quality. As temperatures continue rising, when you start getting toward mean temperatures of about 25 degrees Celsius, the plant, its ability to photosynthesize begins to shortcut. So it has trouble breathing, essentially, which means it can't put as much energy into producing fruit, which means it be your productivity begins to be affected. So now you have impacts on quality, impacts on productivity. These are the two factors that we know affect and move the needle on farmer profitability, right? So climate change, farmer profitability, big problem. Around 30 degrees centigrade, the plant basically just can't survive anymore and dies. But temperatures are rising slowly. Unfortunately for farmers, usually uh, the things that are affecting them in the most dire ways are not a slowly rising temperature, but situations that are quicker and more intense, a shock like a drought. This is a photograph from a drought in El Salvador last year, and you can see how badly deformed this plant looks. So it's definitely affecting the plant's ability to produce. We can safely assume that it's also affecting the quality of whatever small amount of cherry they're getting off it. And we know that droughts are on the rise and predicted to uh, increase in both severity and frequency over the coming years. We believe this is linked to climate change, although it is very difficult to pin any single drought on the wider phenomenon of climate change. But obviously there's a huge drought, uh, drought in Brazil, 2014, led to the loss of nearly a fifth of the country's crop. And as you all know, when Brazil's productivity is affected, the rest of the world is affected. Ethiopia right now is going through one of the worst droughts in 60 years. This is a problem that is um, very deep. And it doesn't just affect coffee, it, it also affects um, you know, food stability, hunger issues. So the communities that coffees live inside, drought doesn't only affect coffee plants, it affects all the plants growing, including food crops for those communities. Also, of course, a topic we're familiar with, disease. So unfortunately for coffee, rising temperatures make are less amenable for the coffee plant. They're more amenable for some of the enemies of the coffee plant. Roy is one example, the borer beetle. Um, I mean, this audience is well, well aware of the effects of the Central American leaf rust crisis that began in 2012. Uh, but there was a uh, follow-up summit that just happened in Guatemala in February where Promo Cafe presented some new numbers about the sort of aggregate impact of this over the last five years, including this statistic, which is really devastating, right? 1.7 million jobs, many of them farm workers, are out of work, and many of them will not go back to coffee. So one kind of crisis, weather-related crisis at a time, we are seeing some of the great coffee regions of the world kind of slowly being chipped away at. But you know this, right? Um, you know this is a problem. You are the ones who put this on the agenda. Early last year, SCAA did a significant survey of its member roasters. And it was a very long document. I think it was like 132 pages, the whole thing. And buried way down on page 122 was, to me, the most interesting number, which was this one. 30% of you said that climate change represented the single biggest threat to your business in 2015. And that is before the climate talks in Paris, where developing countries, many of them coffee producers, were invited to the table for the first time. That was before International Coffee Day and the World Expo in Milan, where climate change was a major topic. That was before the World Coffee Conference in Addis that happened just about a month ago, where again, climate change was a big topic. So I'm willing to bet that if we redid this survey today, the number would be even higher. So you know that climate change is a significant topic. But I know from talking to many of you personally that you also feel like you don't know what to do about it, right? And there's a good reason for that. It's big, it's a big complex topic, but also it's because we don't have the full measure of coffee and climate change yet. We actually know very little in terms of hard specific data on coffee and climate change. We're gonna have some very smart people talking to you today about this topic not one of them 
it dedicates their entire career to studying coffee and climate change. And that's because there basically aren't any people that do that. I think there's maybe a handful. And that's, that's really astounding for a crop that is as significant as coffee is. We listened to some very big numbers being presented yesterday about the economic impact of coffee in America. It's obviously bigger than that around the globe. For a crop that is the size of coffee, the fact that we have virtually no um, specific science being done on climate change in coffee is um, problematic. If you've been at RICO before, you've heard one of my colleagues from World Coffee Research at different times talking about exactly this problem, that coffee is significantly under-researched. Um, so it's not just about climate change, it's about coffee in general. Um, and just to give you one uh, brief example, we spend significantly more money breeding cucumbers than we do breeding coffee. And the cucumber market is like $3.2 billion compared to, what did we learn yesterday? Like, 200 billion, right? So the, the relative sizes uh, of this, they don't make a lot of sense. So we know that. The good news is that we are beginning to build the infrastructure for doing some of this work. So the existence of World Coffee Research is part of that, and this community was, a, was largely responsible for helping create that organization and giving it the mandate that it has to begin studying some of these issues. Um, and also the work that many of the speakers you're going to hear from today. They are doing a lot of the hard work of beginning to figure out how we actually do this, how we address coffee and climate change. We are specifically going to be talking today about adaptation as it relates to climate change. And adaptation, um, it's a theme I introduced in my introductory remarks, um, but I want, to, I want to give you the sort of technical definition of what it is, because you hear this word when we talk about climate change a lot. It specifically means helping cope with the results of climate change. And this is, we have to do this and we have to begin doing this right now because farmers are already seeing the effect of it. And if we don't, then we're not gonna have any coffee to, to keep our businesses going. There's a flip side to adaptation and that's mitigation. This is another kind of jargony technical term. Mitigation means addressing the root causes of climate change, reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And I want to bring this up very briefly because even though we're not going to be talking about mitigation at all today, in some ways it is the place where you can begin to move the needle the most. There have not been very significant um, studies done on the carbon footprint of coffee, so where in the life cycle of the value chain carbon is um, created. But um, there has been one published academic study and a few informal carbon assessments done by companies, and they all basically agree on one point, which is that if you think about the value chain and how many steps coffee goes to to get from there to here, somewhere between five and 20 steps, depending on the coffee, 50% or more of the carbon footprint for coffee comes from the very last step at the cafe. Doesn't even include roasting, right? It's just the lights, the water, the energy to keep the water hot. That's a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. That's the place we have the most control over, right? So we, we I want to just sort of issue the challenge that that is something that you can and I hope will be thinking about um, as you go home today. But we're going to circle back and we're going to talk with our speakers today about adaptation, about the work that is already being done to begin to try to help farmers adapt to this new situation that we find ourselves in. And I think it's a positive message that we're trying to send you home with today, that, the, that even though this is a big topic and it's complex and we don't have all the information that we need, we do have enough to get started. And in fact, people are doing very good work. One of those people happens to be uh, one of my all-time favorite RICO speakers. Uh, he gave a talk in 2013 in Boston that uh, changed my relationship to coffee and, in fact, is one of the reasons I'm standing here today. His name is Aaron Davis. He's a botanist for Kew Gardens. He has the very unique distinction of being uh, probably the living man who's discovered more coffee species than any other living person. I think 22 out of the 124 species that we know of, he'll correct me if I'm wrong about that number, were discovered by Aaron. So he's a very smart guy. He knows a lot about coffee. And over the last couple of years, he has been working on a project in Ethiopia to begin to try to get down into the weeds and get some of this data that we need uh, to really move the needle on climate change in a very particular, very special place, the birthplace of coffee, Ethiopia. So, Aaron. Thank you.